Okay, greetings everyone, and a very happy new year to all. Well, I decided to kick off 2024 with a banger, okay? Something I've been intending to do for a while. Uh, last year, without a doubt, the most popular video on my channel was the video I made about the seven warlords of the sea, which in and of itself was basically a remake of a series of videos I did way back in 2016, right when I first started talking about One Piece regularly on the channel. I was making that transition from Bleach to One Piece. Um, there was also My Hero Academia. Remember when I reviewed that for a hot minute? Yeah, that was fun. Anyway, I did a video series on the seven warlords, and then right after that, I moved on to the four emperors, the Yonko, okay? And I've always intended to go back and redo those videos especially because we really knew like next to nothing about Kaido when I made his video back in like I think it was actually around New Year's 2017 so we weren't even at Wano yet Wano was still like a year and a half away that we were going to get to in the manga and I basically just made a video about Kaido like yeah he's a really big strong guy uh, we don't know what his devil fruit is uh, maybe he doesn't even have one uh, apparently he's immortal so I uh, don't know how they're going to beat him but uh, he's a big guy and he lives in Wano apparently <laughs> like that that was basically the Kaido video and even in the case with Big Mom's video when I filmed that one we were still in the beginning of Tautland like we hadn't even gotten to the tea party yet we knew nothing about her backstory with Mother Caramel or uh, Elbaf or really what she could all do with like the soul soul fruit so I think it is uh, far and above beyond the time to redo that Four Emperors series and what better way to do it than right now to ring in the new year of 2024 today we are gonna be talking about the the four emperors! Disclaimer, there are in fact more than four emperors. If you include various acts of God, getting killed by Blackbeard, and getting chucked into a volcano, there are currently seven characters in the series that are considered emperors at one point or another. Even more so if you include non-canon materials such as light novels and video games. Yeah! Let's do this! All right, I'll dial that back a little bit. Let's start the video off properly by explaining the Emperor system because, you know, like, even the existence of rocks was unknown when I made that first video series, okay? So, the Emperors, unlike the Warlords, are not a organization. They are not something that you have to be invited to join, like the Shishibukai, where the government sends you an invite and you have to accept, and then you become a member of the Warlords, and there's various duties and things that you're expected to do by the world government. The uh, four Emperors are a essentially the four strongest pirates in the world currently that ever did pirate. Um, the whole point of that is really not so much them having their own system, like they don't really get along necessarily, although alliances do happen and when they do they're very, very scary. It's more of just for the world government to just get their handle on the balance of power in the world, right? So you have the world government that has the marines and they also did have the warlords before they were abolished and so that's like one side of a scale. And the other side of that that scale is the Yonko, a group of really powerful pirates that just balance everything out. So that can honestly be seen as like all of the Marines and the Admirals and, you know, the Cypher Pole and all the other things. And so right now it's the SSG, but before that it was the Warlord system. All of that was an attempt to balance the scales, okay? So one side isn't stronger than the other. And also remember, it, it complicates things that the Yonko, they might not ally with one another and sometimes they might just be straight up enemies of one another, okay? So it's all just a game to make sure that one particular party doesn't rule the entire world. Although every once in a while it looks like, oh, this particular Yonko might have a shot at it. Or, oh, it looks like the Marines are getting a little bit strong now. But especially in the era we're in right now in One Piece, that whole system is probably going to collapse at some point. You know, I was even thinking about this. Um, the creation of the world government itself might have actually had a hand in creating the emperors. Because let's think about this. The world government 800 years ago at the tail end of the void century create their you know organization that rules the entire world with the Tenryu Obito on top and the Gorosei and Eam and everything, right? And through that, they enact a bunch of laws. And in order to enforce the laws of the world government, they create the Marines. Well, now that you got a bunch of laws to enforce, there's obviously going to be a bunch of pirates that are going to rebel against those laws and the status quo, and then boom, you have pirates.
pirates. You have Yonko that are really strong pirates. And so it's, it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, where everything has to be balanced in a certain way. The warlords didn't exist back then. They didn't come into play until much later. So I guess at that point, at the very beginning, because I imagine there were, there were emperors back, you know, 800 years ago. Maybe Joy Boy would have been considered one of the emperors in his day. And then, you know, 400 years ago, 200 years ago. Oda doesn't really go into, like, the previous generations of emperors that have existed. Uh, we only know about, like, the seven that have been confirmed to have that title. Uh, in some light novels, like I believe in the Ace Light novel, it was just straight up mentioned that Shiki, the Golden Lion, was an emperor at one point. That makes a lot of sense to me if that turns out to be canon. It's just that Oda has never explicitly mentioned that yet. Uh, Roger was never referred to as an emperor. Rox was never referred to as an emperor, although they certainly had the strength level and, like, the, the size of the crew to, like, yeah, they could have easily been emperors. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if at some point Oda revealed that, okay? But as for, like, the previous generations of everything, you know, it's kind of, like, spotty on that exactly, okay? But yeah, that's the situation with, like, the past of the emperors. Now, what exactly makes an emperor is kind of, uh, once again, debatable. But uh, from what I can understand, if I was going to boil it down to the four requirements to be one of the four emperors, uh, first and foremost, you got to have strength. Like, you got to be a physically strong pirate, whether that be with the use of a devil fruit or just crazy powerful hockey. Um, essentially, conqueror's hockey is a must for this. But you have to strike a kind of imposing presence, okay? I mean, look at Buggy. He's the strongest you've ever seen, right? Okay. But strength is definitely a, a must. Uh, territory is another thing. Uh, Big Mom, Whitebeard, Kaido, they all had massive territories. Big Mom essentially founded her entire country of Tatoland as this archipelago that was under her control. Whitebeard had a bunch of islands. Kaido controlled all of Wano and was branching out. He had other islands beyond Wano. Uh, you know, even Shanks, who's one of the, you know, he's not one of the cruel take over the world kind of emperors, but he still has a lot of islands that are his territory. All right, so that's another big one. Uh, threat to the world government overall. Like, what are the Yonko doing, man? Or is this Yonko going to play by the rules? Or is this Yonko going to be like a take over the whole planet into a pirate paradise, kind of like what Blackbeard and Kaido wanted to do? Then you have somebody that like Shanks, who really doesn't want to take over the entire world. Whitebeard didn't either, okay? So maybe the government's not going to look at them in the same way if they're not, like, their set goal is to go overthrow the status quo of the government, okay? And then finally, something that is overlooked a lot is influence that the emperors have. Influence meaning to inspire more pirates, okay? Why do pirates want to be pirates? Well, I'm sure some of them just want to go out and just raid and pillage for the sake of it, but when you look at Luffy, the, the main critical reason Luffy became a pirate was because of Shanks. Shanks inspired Luffy, just like I'm sure a lot of the other emperors, either directly or indirectly, inspired the next generation. It could be as simple as, like, some farm boy Boy living out in the South Blue, and then he's reading the paper, and he's like, man, I want to join Kaido's crew someday. He's a big dragon god. This guy's awesome. <laughs> you know? Mom, I'm going out to sea to join Kaido's crew. The hell you are! You get back and farm those radishes. Oh, gee shucks. I hate living on this farm. <laughs> And that was the story of young Zeke, who one day would go out to sea and become a member of the Beast Pirates, and then was subsequently killed during the raid on Onigashima. He was one of the random dudes in the festival hall. He was there, trust me, he's dead now, but yeah. So, you know, that's either like indirectly, like you read the newspapers, like, whoa, this Whitebeard guy, he's, he's the kind of man I want to follow, you know what I mean? He's like, I want to be a member of Big Mom's family, you know, and then go out that way, or a direct influence like Shanks was to Luffy. I I'm sure out there somewhere in the world Blackbeard is attacking a town and there's this little kid that's in town and Blackbeard walks up to him and he's like Zeha! You want to join my crew, son? You killed my entire family! Zeha! Yes! Tell you what, I'll give you my pistol. And it's like a moment like with Luffy getting the hat from Shanks Blackbeard takes out one of his pistols and hands it to the kid and he's like Okay, I guess! You know, and then, yeah, there, there you go. That, that, that definitely happened at some point in the series. Okay, but anyway, yeah. Strength, territory, threat to the world government, and the influence that they have on the next generation of pirates. Probably a good place to start. With that all being said, as a build-up, we can now get into this properly. I debated what order to go 
in. I thought about just going in the order that they were revealed in the story, you know, something like that, or maybe should we go by bounty? But I settled on going by their age, so oldest to youngest. And that works out in a bunch of different ways, because that means we're starting with Whitebeard, who is, I think, one of the perfect examples of what a emperor should be in terms of their demeanor and the level of respect that they give their crew, okay? And the other reason that works out is because we'll be ending it with Luffy, who is the youngest emperor, apparently in known history that we know of, at age 19. And Luffy's also going to be the one I'm going to speak about the least, because, like, he's the main character of the manga. The reason Luffy became a Yonko and everything that led up to that, it's literally the entire One Piece manga. So, I don't know, go pick up chapter one and start reading it. It's the new year, you might as well, right? Okay. So, with that being said, let's begin with Edward Newgate. Whitebeard, 72 years young, dead now, but alive in our hearts, okay? So, Whitebeard started out his life on Sphinx Island. At the time, it was war-torn, probably an island that wasn't allied with the world government, so that means there was a lot of pillaging going on, a lot of fires, and uh, Whitebeard was basically part of a street gang. Uh, you see him there wearing a shirt that had the kanji for uh, uh, power on it, you know, something that he wanted, you know, power to, like, save all the people around him, and I think that's really where Whitebeard's character is defined, okay? He doesn't want power to rule the world. He doesn't want power for revenge. He wants power power to protect the people that are the closest to him, okay? And as an extension of that, he wanted a family. I imagine him and everybody else was, you know, an orphan on Sphinx. A lot of the kids didn't really have parents. They might have died at some point with the constant attacks in the uh, the country he was living in, right? So he's like, I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to have a family, and I'm going to protect that family with every scrap of hockey and, and earthquake power that I have, you know what I mean? So uh, he eventually leaves Sphinx, and uh, he becomes a, uh, an apprentice pirate. We see him very briefly during a flashback at Marineford on the first pirate crew he was on. Uh, we don't know the name of this captain or anything like that, but he was on this crew when he was probably in his late teens, early 20s. And it was here when the uh, pirates had amassed a lot of treasure. You know, they had a bunch of uh, a big a big score, I guess. And they're like, ah, Newgate, look at all this gold we've acquired. And, you know, meanwhile, Whitebeard's off to the side. He didn't have his trademark Whitebeard yet. He's off to the side and he's just staring out at the sea. And he's like, oh, don't you care about all this gold? You know, what's the point of being a pirate? And uh, Edward Newgate is just there, and he's like, I would just want to have a family someday. That's all. You know, so you get the idea for Whitebeard's character. Not somebody you would want to cross at all, but somebody whose heart and mind is definitely in the right place, okay? So eventually, Whitebeard finds himself working for Rox. D. Zebeck, the man that wanted to become the ruler of the world. Like, legitimately. The dude wanted to rule the world, okay? Pretty high aspirations. I think Rox was, had a couple of screws loose upstairs. I'm just saying, when we find out his actual character and he's a little insane, I'd be like, yeah, I could kind of see that. Alright, not only him, but also Big Mom, and Kaido and Shiki, a lot of the strongest pirates of the era ended up becoming part of Rox's crew. Their base was on Hachinosu, the pirate paradise, Beehive, full of lead island, whatever you want to call it. Also the place where the Davy back fight originated. Rox himself could have created the Davy back. It could have been through the Davy back that all these strong heavy hitters ended up in this motley crew of a crew. And it was even stated that they didn't really get along. They fought constantly. It was the exact opposite of what Edward really Really wanted for himself. It, it's weird calling him that, right? It's it's not the thing Edward wanted for himself, because we know about him as Whitebeard so much right now, right? But yeah, Rocks Pirates, really strong, but they didn't get along very well. God Valley happens, big epic war, Garp was there, Roger was there, Rocks was there. Rox apparently dies at that moment. We still don't know the whole story with that, although we did just get a flashback of it, the most we've ever seen of God Valley in the story uh, during Kuma's backstory. And uh, at that point, the Rox crew disbands. They all go their separate ways, and Whitebeard sets out on his own, and he founds his own crew, the Whitebeard Pirates. And then we flash forward a little bit to him arriving in Wano. He meets Odin there. They travel for a bit. Odin kind of shows his mettle by being towed, uh, you know, by the Moby Dick, the flagship of 
the Whitebeard Pirates. Uh, Whitebeard finally, he's about to accept him, and then Odin leaves to go save Toki, and that was the thing that kind of just sealed it. You know, Whitebeard's like, all right, you know, I'll accept you on my ship as a sworn brother, okay? So that's the way that Whitebeard literally viewed his crew, as his brothers and as his children, quite literally, and they all referred to him as Pops. Um, later on, Ace, when he became a member of the crew, would even, you know, ask them about it. You know, it's like, why do you call him Pops? And it's like a lot of the people on Whitebeard's crew, they didn't really have, you know, maybe uh, parents that were around, you know, that you don't really exactly become a pirate because you have a happy home life, you know what I mean? So it's like, hey, we look up to him because, you know, to him, um, to us, he is our father, you know what I mean? And so he treated them as such. When you look at the shitty way that Kaido treated a lot of his crew, that Big Mom treated her own crew, and that's the messed up thing, because Big Mom's crew were her legitimate family. They were her actual children, and she treated them like crap a lot of the times, and sometimes, in some cases, straight up attacking them. You know, even Pudding, who Big Mom needed for her master plan to occur to read the Poneglyphs, treated like absolute garbage. Whitebeard, his family are not related to him by blood, but he treats them more like a family than Big Mom ever did to her own kids. Is that not great storytelling, ladies and gentlemen? I love it, okay? So, um, Whitebeard, you know, he doesn't want to conquer the entire Grand Line. He doesn't even want to find the One Piece. He was good friends with Roger. They had a very strong rivalry. After, you know, uh, their last meeting, Roger even said, like, hey, you want me to tell you how to get to Laugh Tale? You can get there. You can have the One Piece. You can have it. I'm okay with you having it, Edward. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, Edward is like, uh, nah, I have no interest in that place. I don't really care. And so that's, that's perfect. You know, at that point in his life, Whitebeard pretty much had everything he wanted. He had the family. He had the strength in order to protect his family. And uh, he just wanted to maintain that. Now, he's still a pirate. You don't want to cross him. The government still has a bounty out for him. They're still being attacked by the Marines on the daily basis. Um, and so at that point, you know, they have to go off on adventures and everything like that. And that's, that's just what Whitebeard wanted, right? And so that continued for many years. Uh, there's a lot of strife that occurred, like when Odin, for example, went back to Wano, and then he died, and then there was the debate of whether or not to attack Wano, and Whitebeard opted not to. Uh, that would actually be a good what-if scenario video. Like, what if Whitebeard decided to get, like, a crack team together and go after, you know, uh, Kaido and Orochi? Like, would they have succeeded? It's, it's an interesting little question there. But anyway, it was mentioned in the years leading up to Marineford, so the years leading up to the present story, Whitebeard and his crew really were not part of anything big, like any high-profile like uh, uh, gigs or anything like that. And I, I think the main reason for that is Whitebeard realized, like, number one, he was getting older and he had a, a, a disease that he was stricken with. Now, they could manage the disease to an extent, but I think Whitebeard realized that, like, you know, his, his number was going to be up pretty soon, okay? And, and once again, it was... Not, like, necessarily a lack of motivation. His motivation was never on taking over the Grand Line or, or defeating the world government or anything like that, right? He was just more of just satisfied as having a family. So, other than fighting the Marines every once in a while, there, there was nothing really huge for him to go after. It wasn't like, you know, all right, men, I have decided all of a sudden we're going after the One Piece. Now, if he would have decided that, his crew would have been up behind him 100%. They would have followed him into hell itself. Well, we'll follow you into a Ernest Pops, if that's what we have to do. You know, they would have definitely have done that, right? Um, but, you know, that, you know, and he probably would have succeeded, honestly. Like, getting to Laugh Tale, it was mentioned multiple times. He was the strongest man in the world, and he was the man that stood closest to getting the One Piece. During Doflamingo's speech, he mentioned that Whitebeard stood before the throne but never claimed it for himself. I love that quote from Dofi, okay? And so, yeah, that was basically that. Now, the one thing that threw a wrench in all this, because I'm sure Whitebeard was sitting there drinking his sake, and he was, oh, sorry, his medicine. He was drinking his medicine, and he's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. I've lived a good life, you know? Even if I don't have that many years left, I'm happy with where it all ended out, you know what I mean? And then Blackbeard happened. Dude, like, Pops is already like 70, he's sick, and then Blackbeard is gonna pull this grade A bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, he couldn't just, you know, Blackbeard couldn't have just waited until Whitebeard died. He probably didn't have that many years left to begin with, you know what I mean? Just, oh my god, talk about causing stress in your old age, you know what I mean? 
So Whitebeard's crew was divided into 16 divisions, okay, with a division leader for each one. I'm not going to go into every single one of the division leaders. I already made a video about that. You can go check that out if you want to. Two divisions you need to know about right now that are pertinent, okay? The uh, second division, which was originally headed up by Odin, Kozuki, and then it was vacant for a while, and then Porcus Deace, when he joined, became the leader of the second division, Luffy's older brother, okay? Also, as a member of the second division, was a little no-name pirate that had been a member of Whitebeard's crew for several decades at that point, by the name of Marshall D. Teach, okay, who would later be known as Blackbeard. The other division you need to know about is the 4th Division, which was headed up by Thatch. Uh, fun fact, uh, historical Blackbeard's real name was Marshall Thatch. So you have Marshall Thatch, and then Thatch was the character that Teach kills, who's, you know, that's the whole, you know, little reference that Oda's going for there. Anyway, also Thatch was the head chef of the Whitebeard uh, crew. The 4th Division was like the cooking division, so something else you didn't, maybe didn't know. All right. Thatch found a devil fruit one day, and as per the rules on Pops' ship, whoever finds it gets to eat it. You know, it's their property. It's like, all right, yeah, if anybody finds a devil fruit out there, it's yours. You want to give it to someone else? Fine, but you're the one that found it. You're the one that's allowed to eat it. That's how the rule is. I'm not handling any of this shit again. You get a devil fruit, it's yours. That's it. Okay. So Thatch found it. And then Blackbeard, well, that was the fruit that he wanted. He had been studying the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia for years. That was the one he wanted. He sees that fruit, and he's like, all right, well, it's an ironclad rule of the ship, so it's Thatch's. I guess I could politely ask him for it. Now I'm just going to stab him. <laughs> you know, so uh, Blackbeard stabs Thatch and kills him in cold blood, takes the fruit, and ditches the Whitebeard crew. Now, Ace immediately sets off to go bring him back because, you know, he's the division commander that Blackbeard was part of. So it's like, okay, it's my responsibility. But uh, this really also goes to showcase Whitebeard's uh, opinion on, like, this kind of treachery, okay? Like, Big Mom even said it later in the story, but, you know, pirates have a code. You know, I made a video about that as well. The pirate code, matey! There's going to be a lot of supplemental stuff in this video. A lot of cards you need me to click on if I remember to put them all in. But anyway, yeah. Uh, there's a great line that uh, Whitebeard has with Shanks when Shanks eventually meets him later to discuss Blackbeard and be like, hey, you should probably call back Ace because this isn't going to end well. You know, uh, Blackbeard's pretty dangerous. He gave me the scar I have. You know, he could easily kill Ace. And Whitebeard has a line that was essentially, um, you know, you don't understand. What am I supposed to say to the soul of my son that has died? Every time someone joins my crew, no matter how stupid they are they become like a son to me you know i have to teach teach i have to drill it into his thick skull that there is a code in this world that you do not break okay and that's that's coming from whitebeard okay that is basically whitebeard saying that like look as a pirate i have plundered i have murdered i have done some things that people would consider reprehensible and unforgivable but even as a pirate there are rules, and there's a code of conduct, and if there's one thing you do not cross, no matter what, even the shitty pirates, even the evil pirates know this much, you don't kill a crewmate, especially not by stabbing them in the back. You know, it's one thing if maybe crewmates have a, have, a, have a quarrel with each other and they, like, agree to a duel or something. You know, it's like, okay, I agree to a duel. All right, we'll fight. And, you know, whoever lives wins. Whoever loses dies. I mean, that, that even is a little bit iffy. But, like, to get to the point where it's like, I'm just going to kill someone for a devil fruit, man. Like, I am sure Whitebeard at that moment, like... Even the destruction of the world itself would not have stopped. The, the Armageddon itself would not have stopped Whitebeard from bringing Teach to justice, okay? If he was only 10 years younger, let me tell you. That's not even an exaggeration. If Whitebeard was just 10 years younger, he would have probably wrecked Blackbeard's shit severely after that happened, right? Well, anyway, um, unfortunately, uh, it got distracted a little bit there because Ace eventually does catch up to Blackbeard. However, he gets uh, defeated by him, gets dragged into the Marines, uh, thrown an impel down, and set for execution. So now... On top of having to worry about the Blackbeard situation, this kind of takes precedence because if Whitebeard doesn't do something quick, then Ace is going to die. So that kicks off the Paramount War. The War of the Best at Marineford essentially um, ends the first part or the first half of One Piece, right? So Whitebeard gets not just his own crew together and all the divisions, but also gets 
as you can imagine, a man of his uh, withstanding and the kind of respect that he commands has a lot of allies that he's gathered all over the years. Uh, in some cases, they are people that used to be part of his crew, uh, like Whitey Bay, for instance, and Epoida, who used to be members of Whitebeard's crew back in the day, but then broke off and then started their own crews. So they're basically like Whitebeard's in-laws in a certain way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these are his, ext his all extended family coming for Christmas dinner. You know, so they gather them all together and there's this big epic war at Marine Ford. I'll let you go watch it. It was crazy. The shenanigans that occurred there were fun. What's your favorite moment of Marine Ford? That's a good question for the Whitebeard segment of this video. I should actually do that. If for every Yonko we discuss here, I should bring up like a question relating to them, okay, for you to answer in the comment section. So for Whitebeard's question, what is your favorite moment from Marine Ford? You know, the entire arc. You know, let me know in the comments down below, okay? Well, unfortunately, even though Whitebeard gives it his all and we see him bust some giant heads and uh, the scene with Luffy was really good and him busting out earthquakes with his Gura Gura Nomi. Oh yeah, by the way, he has the Gura Gura Nomi. Strongest paramecia in the world. Big whoop. Want to fight about it? Whitebeard does not. Whitebeard doesn't, you know? He understands that he has another thing too about Whitebeard's demeanor. Dude literally has the power to destroy the world. Sengoku said as much. With the power of the Gura Gura no Mi in the hands of somebody that is straight up chaotic evil, you could just be causing massive earthquakes and tsunamis all over the planet. You can mess up the Earth's like uh, crust and mantle pretty good with that power. You could erupt volcanoes and everything. But did Whitebeard use it like that? Did Whitebeard use it as a tool of like, I am the ruler of the world? You know, nothing like that. No. You know, it really goes to show, as Uncle Ben said it best, with great power comes great responsibility, and Whitebeard had both of those, power and responsibility, in spades. Mm hmm So, anyway, awesome battle, awesome war. Not a great ending for Whitebeard. Uh, he takes a lot of shots from all over the battlefield, cannon fire, sword wounds, everything, gunshots. Not a single wound on his back, though, because he never turned his back in a fight. And uh, also took some serious magma punches from a kainu, one in the gut, one in the chest, one in the face. Uh, in the anime, they have to tone it down a bit, but in the manga, man, half of it, not half of his face, but like a good, like, you know, a good quarter of his face is torn off by that attack. And he's already, as I mentioned, sick from, you know, uh, unidentified old man disease. It's killed a lot of anime characters throughout the years, Whitebeard just being one of them. Uh, but yeah, he wasn't gonna make this, he wasn't gonna make it out of here alive anyway, probably. Uh, and those injuries just kind of cinched it, alright? So, at the end of Marine Ford, you have Blackbeard showing up, and it was like part of his plan the entire time. And him and his crew, the Blackbeard Pirates, uh, gunned down Whitebeard right there. Ace is also dead at this point, and it's a very somber end to this war. We're thinking Whitebeard and Luffy and everybody are gonna get in there, they're gonna work together, they're gonna free Ace, and they're all gonna get out and live happily ever after. I did do a what-if video about that. Uh, what if Ace would have survived? And, uh, yeah, though, it doesn't go down that way. Ace dies, uh, very tragically, and so does Whitebeard. Uh, he gets gunned down by, uh, Blackbeard's crew, but he dies standing up, and then Blackbeard, using some method we don't know yet, was able to steal the Gura Gura no Mi and have that power for himself, okay? And, uh, yeah, Whitebeard, um, thankfully Shanks shows up, another Yonko, and, uh, stops the war right there in its tracks, and takes Whitebeard's body and Ace's body away to be buried properly, which... Thank God that Shanks was there for that, because you can only imagine what the Marines would have done if, uh, you know, they probably would have, like, thrown their bodies up at Marine Fort or somewhere to, like, display to the world or, like, on top of the red line or something at Marijois. Like, this is the corpse of Whitebeard. This is the corpse of Porcus D. Ace and the son of Roger and just leave them out there on pikes and let the buzzards go at them until their skeletons were nothing left. And, like, this is a reminder of why you don't mess with the world government. So, good thing Shanks got their bodies. Um, now, whether or not they're Buried on uh, Sphinx is a little debatable because it's mentioned that, like, um, it was mentioned they were buried not far from Whitebeard's home island. And we do see the island where they were buried, and it didn't look like Sphinx. Sphinx has a very distinctive mountain in the center. Either way, they're buried close enough to Sphinx that, like, Marco can kind of keep an eye on the graves. Uh, his uh, trusty weapon, Murokumo Giri, the uh, Saijo Owaz Monograde Blade, uh, the, the Great Sky Cutter, that was also placed at his grave there uh, next to 
ace, and so he's buried next to his child. And so uh, that's the finale. That's the end of Edward Newgate. Um, I've made plenty of other videos going into further detail about every aspect of this. Like, I made a whole video just about Murokumo Giri, if you're more interested in the in the weapon and his uh, Naganata, so you can go check that out there. But uh, this was already this is the first portion of this video, and we're already, like, a good ways into it. So I'm going to move on now. But Whitebeard, in my opinion, honestly, it would be probably between him and Shanks. But honestly, just to see that he was like he lived longer and the way he went out and everything that he was about, Whitebeard truly was an emperor. He was a man that had power but did not abuse it and cherished and respected everybody around him that was part of his crew. Whitebeard, rest in peace, man. All right. Moving on, uh, since we're going in order of oldest to youngest at age 68, we are talking now about Charlotte Linlin, Big Ma'am. Big Mom, but yeah, Big Ma'am, you know, if Cartman was the one saying it. All right, so uh, Charlotte Linlin uh, was born to actually normal parents. Uh, yeah, they were just regular people. That's interesting. Uh, but she grew up really fast. At age five, she was already comparable in size to like a child uh, giant. So she was pretty big. Uh, she wrecked the town that her parents lived in. And so they were basically like, okay, this is a problem. We can't have her around much anymore. Her parents did seem rather distraught about abandoning her though. It, it seems like something they didn't want to do. Uh, like, get out of here. We don't want you anymore. But it was more of like, uh, I really hate that we have to do this, but she literally is a liability. I mean, every time she gets hungry, she flattens the entire town and kills dozens of people. We, we can't have her around that much, right? Um, so uh, they do Operation Beached Whale, where uh, they enlist the aid of, a, I think, a pirate crew, and they basically just drop Big Mom off uh, at the age of five on the shores of Elbaf, which is the land of the giants, because it was mentioned that there is a nun that lives on this island that has an orphanage by the name of Mother Caramel. And every time there's a child in the world that's, you know, much of a, like a ruffian or can't be handled very well, that's when and uh, Mother Caramel will apparently take them and everything will be okay. So apparently it's like their last effort, the only place in the world that they could leave her where she might actually have a shot at having a normal life, uh, otherwise just abandoning her, like on a deserted island somewhere. Like, this is your best option with Mother Caramel. And hey, it, it's already the land of the giants, so if nothing else, like, you know, her size won't be something that will be uh, dangerous, okay, because it's where the giants live, right? So they drop her off and they leave her there. And uh, Big Mom actually adapts very well to living in Elba. There's a line that I, I love uh, during this flashback where it mentions that because this is the first time in Big Mom's life that she had been in a place that things suited her own size, like the buildings and the people and everything was so massive. It was very comforting to her because at that point she had always been in like normal human settlements that, you know, were too small for her. So I like that. The idea that like, hey, maybe if nothing bad happened there, um, if if the Semla incident hadn't occurred, uh, Big Mom maybe would have just grown up on Elbaf and then everything would have been OK. She would have just lived amongst the giants, you know, maybe something like that would have occurred. Right. Uh, probably not because of Mother Caramel's true nature. Uh, if, if nothing happened with the Semla and the death of Fallbeard probably would have resolved in her getting sold off to the Marines anyway. Which is, once again, another what-if video that a lot of people have recommended to me. What if Big Mom actually did come become a Marine? Uh, and it's like, okay, yeah, I might, I might tackle that one at some point, too. It's a new year, a lot of opportunities. So, you have Mother Caramel. You also have uh, Girth and uh, Hyruden, who was there as well. They were all, like, children at that point. And uh, growing up on Elbaf, uh, Dory and Bragi were still way back at Little Garden having their fight, but uh, Oimo and Kashi were there, former members of the Giant Warrior Pirates. There were also the elders of the village. There was Lord Mountainbeard and Lord Fallbeard, who were well over 300 years old and were, like, legends to the Giants, right? And, uh, you know, there was the orphanage, the Lamb's House, or the Sheep's House, where a bunch of the other kids that were taken, like, there was one kid that was, like, a prince from a kingdom that had been overthrown, so he ended up here and uh, there were some other kids that had wandered there and so everyone kind of became a family there now Big Mom, even on Elbaf, though, her strength was very apparent. Uh, she one-shots a bear, not just a normal bear, but an Elbaf bear. These are the bears that the giants hunt. And Big Mom at age five was able to kill one with a slap. So dead in one hit. And so, you know, even Mother Caramel is like, ooh. And there's even a scene where she uh, smacks a mosquito on one of the giant's arms. Like a giant had a mosquito on his arm. Granted, it was probably a giant mosquito. But then Big Mom is like, oh, I see it. Ow! And then breaks the giant's arm. So even 
in the world of giants, her strength is greater than them at a young age. Okay, so, you know, keep that in mind. All right. So uh, there's a little bit of a festival, a tradition, as it were, uh, in Elbath. Uh, during the winter solstice, there is a festival where you honor the sun. Hmm. Sun worship in One Piece. Wonder if that's going to go back to anything later. Anyway, uh, you fast during this festival. That's what you do, uh, where for a certain number of days, I can't remember how many days it was. I think it was just a week or maybe 10 days, something like that, uh, where you just kind of only drink like water, okay? And you fast, and then there's this big feast, okay? And so before the feast, though, there was a, I mean, before the fast, there was a feast, yes. And um, there was a lot of semla, which is a dessert on uh, Elbaf, okay? And so Big Mom ate a bunch of these, and she fell in love with this dessert. And then immediately after that, she had to fast for several days. And granted, she did make it a few days, um, but after a while, she basically snapped and she had her hunger pangs. This is a uh, condition that she has that will plague her the rest of her life, where she essentially just goes mad with hunger and she loses all sense of rationality and she just attacks everything and everyone around her, friend or foe or family alike, until somebody takes the food that she's craving and shoves it down her mouth, okay? That is, that is the best way you can solve it, okay? So that happens with Big Mom. She loses her shit over the Semla. She's like, Semla! And she wrecks the giant village of Elbath, burns it to the ground. Um, the giants go to stop her. She picks them up and is just tossing them around like rag dolls. And it's like, oh, get the Semla. We need to get her the Semla so she'll calm down, right? And then that's when Lord uh, Fallbeard shows up, the elder, trying to finish her off. She's like, I'm sorry, Mother Caramel, but she's gotta die! And that's when um, Big Mom grabs fall beard by the beard, smacks him to the ground, gives him a serious concussion. He, he was already pretty old already, so uh, he ends up dying from this. So not only... You gotta think about this from the perspective of the Giants. This is their, like, elder. This is essentially a dude that is, might as well be a demigod to these people. Like, cemented in the honor of, like, Valhalla. This is where Fallbeard is gonna go, right? But... He is killed, not in battle valiantly against the hordes of enemies or something like giants and vikings should go out. He gets killed by a five-year-old girl wearing a muumuu. Yeah, so that is massively dishonorable to the giants, and they have an extreme distaste for Big Mom after this point, you know? So, because of that, Mother Caramel has to move the lamb's house. Gotta get out of there because the giants aren't gonna let them stay anymore. So, the Giants are still very friendly to Mother Caramel because she has helped them out before, saving a lot of the uh, former members of the Giant Warrior Pirates. So, they help her set up a new lamb's house on another island, which would eventually become Totland, way, long, like, way more into the future. Uh, it would eventually become Whole Cake Island, but builds up the lamb's house, and then they live there for a time. Uh, but not long after uh, that, uh, Big Mom turns six, and for her sixth birthday, they give her a big cake of Semla. And what happens next? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious what happens next. But we technically did not see it, so we're not really sure. But the idea is that Big Mom, literally in her fit of joy, eating her cake, and her eyes were shut, and she was crying, and just like, oh my god, this is the happiest day of my life. She ends up eating Mother Caramel and all the other children that were at the table. And so after she devours the Semla cake, she opens her eyes, the table is also partially eaten, and just a couple scraps of clothing is around her. And uh, yeah, Big Mom has essentially eaten Mother Caramel, which results in Big Mom receiving Mother Caramel's ability, her devil fruit power, which was the soul soul fruit. The ability to manipulate her own soul, give her soul to inanimate objects to make them uh, uh, animated beings called homies, and then also she can take the soul out of other people using various techniques, okay? And so it's a very, very strong devil fruit power. Um, Mother Caramel, though, was, turns out to not be a great person. Turns out she was a slave trader for the world government uh, called Mountain Witch, and she was going to plan on selling off uh, Big Mom to the Marines anyway. Uh, she had already done this with some previous uh, people, like John Giant ended up joining the Marines because of this. She was doing some backroom deals with uh, Cypher Pole Zero the entire time. So, not a great person. Uh, did she deserve to get eaten by Big Mom? Uh, yeah, probably. There were two people on the island that witnessed this. One was a giant that had been visiting, and he's sees that, and he immediately books it back to Elbaf and tells everybody the horror story he just saw. So they definitely hate Big Mom even more now. And the other person on the island was a little guy by the name of Stroysen. And Stroysen had the ability of the uh, ingredient fruit, the cook cook fruit, so he can turn any inanimate object into food. And he meets Big Mom, and it's through these two that the Big Mom pirates are founded here, where uh, Stroysen kind of just 
honestly influences Big Mom in a way that's really messed up if you think about it. Just the idea that Stroyson is an adult here and Big Mom is, yeah, she's huge, but she's only six. And Stroyson is manipulating Lin Lin to the point of like, let's go, you know, conquer the seas and be bad and attack bad people and murder and everything like that, right? Yeah, kind of, kind of messed up when you really think about it. There's also implications that Pero Sparrow, the first son of Big Mom, might in fact be Stroyson's son because Stroyson looks very similar to Pero Sparrow and the implications there are even more disgusting. So let's just move on. Um, so over the years, uh, she begins to have, once she turns 18, she starts having children. She's called Big Mom for a reason. She has 87 kids as of the current storyline. So she gives birth every year from the time she was 18 all the way up to when she was 60. Uh, she has 87 kids because a lot of years, sometimes she has more than one, uh, some twins or triplets or quadruplets or quintuplets or decuplets. At one point, she had 10 kids at once. Um, and so they form the main force of the Big Mom crew. But there's also other members that join as well, like Peckoms and um, Tamago, who are not members of her family. Getting a little bit ahead of myself, though, she begins having children, but then she does not have her own pirate crew. She joins the Rocks crew, just like Whitebeard and Kaido at this point, okay? And Big Mom is sort of like a uh, big sister figure to um, Kaido at this point, you know, because Kaido is a little younger, and so she's just like, oh, well, you know, everybody else on this crew sucks, but, you know, follow me, kid. I'll show you the right way to be a pirate kind of stuff, right? And so they had a little bit of a of a friendship there, and it's uh, Big Mom that ends up saving Kaido at God Valley, and the reason Kaido got his devil fruit, the dragon fruit, uh, is because of Big Mom, from what we understand. Um, so there's that there. They have a little bit of a falling out later, but then they become uh, they allied again during Wano. So, um, yeah, and also, by the way, by extension, Stroyson is also a member of the Rocks crew at the time as well. So, all that is going on. Uh, her first children were around during when she was a member of the Rocks crew, like Pero Sparrow, Katakuri, who is her strongest child, uh, as her second son, and then Oven and Daifuku um, and Compote. You know, they would have all been around at this point, um, but probably weren't really much for fighting, so probably stayed behind a lot whenever they, like, I don't think they were present. Like, Katakuri was there at God Valley or anything like that. He would have only been, like, um, at God Valley, he would have been probably, like, 12 or something like that. No, he would have been 10. Yeah. Katakuri would have been 10. Um, Montdor was born at that point. And I think Montdor was her 18th child who would have been born the year of God Valley, right? So she already had a lot of kids at that point, but where they were out fighting with her, not quite yet. So God Valley happens. Rocks dies, and then, okay, Big Mom goes off on her own, much like Whitebeard, creates the Big Mom Pirates in full force, sets up her home base at Whole Cake Island, which was the former island where the Lamb's House was built, and so uh, begins to expand outwards. And with her powers of the Soul Soul Fruit, she essentially has the massive amount of uh, workforce, not just in her crew and her allies and her family itself, but also just all of the objects that she creates, okay? So she has a big surveillance network. It was mentioned Big Mom's crew has the largest surveillance network in the world. World. Uh, she even gathers a poneglyph at that point, a road poneglyph at that. So one of the keys to finding the uh, the laugh tail, the the laugh tail, the one piece on laugh tail, right? Um, she has an encounter with Roger on a few occasions. I mean, they, I guess they would have clashed at God Valley, but there's also another moment where Roger makes his way into Totland and manages to, uh, get a rubbing of Big Mom's Poneglyph and get out, so Big Mom didn't really care for that too much. Um, like I said earlier, the way that she treats her children is absolutely awful. Uh, if they help her out, that's great, but even in some cases when they're fighting for her, she'll, like, even when Katakuri was fighting at the tea party, she was just like, Katakuri, do you think I cannot fight myself? And Katakuri He's like, no, mama, I wasn't saying that, but really, we need to deal with this threat right now, you know? And so in a lot of cases, even like we saw with Moscato, uh, when she's in the middle of a hunger pang, she does not know family from anything else, and so she will just attack her own children if need be, right? Um, so she wrecks Totland every now and then with the hunger pangs, but I imagine they've gotten used to it. Uh, people end up living in Totland if for nothing else there is protection from an emperor there. Uh, it is a little dangerous, like a natural disaster sometimes when she enters the pa hunger pang mode. But other than that, I mean, it's it's safe, sure. Um, you have to pay a tax in Totland that's a little unique. You gotta give, um, like, I think, uh, six months of your soul. Or every six months you have to give one month of your soul in order to live in the country. And that soul energy is used to fuel and create more homies in the area. 
So she builds up this big country here, has a bunch of children. Um, some other ones that are notable are Lola and Chiffon, who are twins. Uh, their father is Pound. Uh, she, eventually, she essentially like has um, a man come in, and then they do the deed, and then after that she kicks them out like they're harvest drones or whatever. Uh, Pound's the only one that we really know about there. Um, but uh, she ends up uh, marrying off or attempts to marry off Lola to Loki, who is a member of the giant clan, who is, you know, the prince of Elbath. However, that marriage falls through because Lola didn't, you know, want to marry Loki. And so now Big Mom hates her as well as, you know, that solidifies even more so the giants hating Big Mom and Totland. It was like, right about to form an alliance. Uh, all of the races of the world live in Totland except for giants and Lunarians. And we also haven't seen any Skypeans that live there. So maybe there was three races. It was mentioned that don't live there, so maybe Skypeans is the last one, but uh, long arms, long legs, minks, uh, mermaids, and fishman, um, snake necks, they all reside in Totland, okay? So that was her kind of uh, setup, and she had one of the more, like, concrete um, uh, territories as a Yonko. It wasn't just one island or a fortress like Wano or a bunch of scatterings of islands like uh, Shanks or Whitebeard. It was an entire country that she ruled in one region of the sea. It's like, don't enter that area. Big Mom controls all of that, and she's not going to like it too much. You don't want to make Mama angry, right? Um... And so I'm trying to think of anything else major before we get into the present, because, you know, once we get to the present of the story, you know, then we get to the whole situation of, you know, the Whole Cake Island arc and Sanji and the Straw Hats. Uh, my question relating to Big Mom would be, uh, who is your favorite member of the Charlotte family? Who is your favorite uh, kid that Big Mom has? Uh, could either be because of their abilities, their personalities, or maybe just their aesthetic. Maybe you just really like, you know, the way that, like, their designs are, their outfits, or, or something like that, right? You know, it could be whatever. Um, you know, personally, probably one of my favorite members is uh, Charlotte Raisin. I like Charlotte Raisin. He has the very, like, stern face, and he uses a sword. He has hockey in it. That's cool. Uh, Ewan is cool, too. Ewan is the guy that has, like, the little emoji face, and he has the giant, like, staff that he hits people with. That guy was cool. Um... Probably the other notable child that she had, aside from Katakuri and Lola, would be uh, Pudding. Pudding is a member of the Third Eye Tribe, or rather half a member of the Third Eye Tribe, because despite her appearance, Big Mom is in fact human. And uh, as a member of the Third Eye Tribe, Pudding, when she awakens this power, should be able to decipher and read anything, including the Poneglyph. So that was kind of Big Mom's plan, to awaken Pudding's power, read all of the road Poneglyphs, and then go and find the One Piece, right? And despite that, she treated Pudding horribly, like, Ah, mama, 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 you're such a creepy kid, Pudding. I mean, jeez, hide that eye. I mean, I, need, I, I know I need it in order to find the One Piece and become king of the pirates and rule the world, mama, 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 but man, that eye is creepy. <laughs> you know, so horrible mom, not very supportive. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically that after the events of, uh, Whole Cake Island, which occurs, you know, Luffy busts in, they get Sanji back, they escape her domain, she has a massive hunger pang, she begins to shrivel up a bit, Sanji makes a cake, she eats it, good times had by all, and she loves the cake so much, her heart grew three times the size, and now she's good. Can you imagine if that was the result of that arc? Sanji defeats a Yonko with a cake. <laughs> you know, that would be cool. Uh, but no, I'm glad. I'm glad that didn't happen. Uh, she eventually is like, all right, well, Strats are going to Wano. I'm going to Wano too. She goes to Wano, allies with Kaido, has a big fight at Onigashima with a bunch of different characters. Uh, they fight on the roof very briefly, but eventually it comes down to Big Mom versus Law and Eustace Kid. That fight is really intense, really high-octane stuff going on. They're busting out their awakenings. Law's got his uh, R room and his chrome, and then Kid's got his, you know, damned punk railgun firing and blasting all over the place. Good fight. Really good animation in there in some of the episodes. So, um, basically the way how you finish off a Yonko, turns out you just got to throw him into a volcano. Don't know why no one thought of it before, but... Now that happened, and so we're we're two out of the seven Yonko have been dipped into a, a volcano, all right? So Big Mom being one of the two, fell down a hole, was defeated by Law and Kid's combo attack, and she ended up in the magma veins of the volcano under Mount Fuji at Wano. Uh, her current status? We don't know. Um, the hole has claimed her, so... 
could be dead. She could come back out. Maybe she's a cyborg right now. Maybe she's a zombie. Or maybe she's just really messed up. The last thing she did say as she was falling into the hole was, or didn't say because um, our room was, like, making her quiet. But she thought to herself that, like, don't you think for a second this is going to kill me. And uh, also she thought about Roger really quick. Like, Roger, this is all your fault, you son of a bitch. <laughs> You know, like if it wasn't for you claiming there was this treasure, we wouldn't be dealing with this stupid batch of new idiots right now. Oh my God, falling. Ah, mama, mama, mama. And then she falls in and uh, he's like, where was the One Piece, Roger? You better not have been lying to me. So yeah, that's Big Mom. Uh, kind of something I did overlook a little bit here was uh, her three personal homies that she has. Actually, four of them, uh, because she replaces Zeus. So you have Zeus the Thundercloud, eventually becomes Hera, uh, lightning-based homie. Then you have her bicorn hat, Napoleon, which becomes a sword. And then you have Prometheus, who is a fireball. And in some cases, like you can see back here in this pop figurine, she can combine with her homies to have, like, fire hair. And she can ride on Zeus like a cloud and everything like that. And uh, Napoleon has a sword. Um, she also has a technique, um, called the, uh, the 3,000 Leagues of, uh, Mother's Misery, where she basically combines all of her three personal homies together into, like, a giant spectral lady with huge boobs that's just like, ah! It's like a giant ghost demon version. She has a lot of techniques. She has a laser beam. Big Mom could fire a laser beam. True story. She hit a pachycephalosaurus with it once. <laughs> okay? Um, so yeah, a lot of discussions about her personal weapons. I'm not really going to go into that too much because I've made separate videos about that stuff. I've made separate videos about uh, Big Mom's homies. I've made separate videos about her devil fruit power and the Yonko weapons and everything like that. So you can go check those out as well. But in that case, moving on now to uh, next uh, oldest Yonko. So uh, this will be Kaido at age 59. Okay, so Kaido, or just Kaido. That's the only name he's ever been uh, known by. He was born in a nice little kingdom, a nice humble area, just a little country village, you know, lots of bakeries. There was bakeries on every single street corner. Flowers were growing, a nice water wheel, like the, the Swiss Alps were in the distance, you know, a very nice, pleasant place to grow up, a place that's like on the, the cover of like a hot chocolate package or something like that. Uh, no, that's not where he ended up. No, he grew up in a war-torn country called the Vodka Kingdom, so you know what they were all about, right? Yeah, they just drank vodka as water. That's all they had, right? Okay. So, um, if you saw the movie One Piece Stampede, that is pretty much the backstory of Kaido. Uh, it's interesting that we have Douglas Bullet, really strong, tough guy, Kaido, really strong, tough guy. That was basically the same backstory, okay, that, that uh, happened with that. So he was really strong even as a kid. He was basically a super soldier. So that means he was drafted into the army, obviously, right? Super strong, Oni-looking kid. He's got horns sticking out of his skull. Could swing a conobo like nobody's business. He can knock some heads, point him at the enemy, and tell him to go wild. All right? That's what he did. And he did that for a number of years, got really good at it. But it was sort of a thing where if you're that strong... And you get stronger and stronger and stronger. So by the time you're a teenager, you're already strong enough to, like, one-shot mountains and shit. People are going to be kind of leery around you. It, it, it goes from, wow, kid, you're a really great asset in our army, to stay the hell away from me. You are really freak show strong. It, it, that happens quick. And eventually it even gets to the point where even, like, the generals of the army and even the king of the vodka kingdom were like, all right, this kid is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. You know what I mean? We we got to get rid of this guy. So eventually you have the Marines and the Cypher Pole show up and uh, very much in the same vein as what happened with Mother Caramel and uh, Cypher Pole is like, oh, well, you know, draft him into the Marines. You know, he'll be great. He'll be an admiral someday. Fantastic. Uh, mm, a parallel world of One Piece where both Kaido and Big Mom ended up as the Marines in the Marines and they become admirals. Interesting, is it not? Absolutely. So, he gets sold off to uh, the Marines. Uh, immediately escapes, by the way. Uh, you know, busts out of there. Uh, gets captured quite a few times, actually. He's not invincible in that regard, although most of the times he was captured was just because he was hungry. So, he breaks away from the Marines, runs off, but then he gets hungry again. He's like, oh man, where do I find food? You know, the Marines have good food, and so he gets captured again, eats, 
you know, wipes out everybody on board, blows up the ship, and then gets out of there. Uh, does not have a devil fruit yet. This is just him just naturally strong. Um, the idea is that he's uh, a member of, like, the ancient giant race. Uh, or, like, his great-great-grandfather would have been somebody like an ancient giant, like Ors or something like that, right? Because he has horns, and his uh, child, Yamato, also has horns. So the idea is, like, it is genetic, right? And he ends up becoming an apprentice on Rox's ship. There were so many other high-profile pirates like Wang and Shiki and Whitebeard. Uh, you know, Kaido was basically the guy that had to swab the deck. He was only about 15 years old at this point. Um, and so he joins up with the crew, and he fights with them for a while. And eventually, like we've talked about with the last three characters, God Valley happens, all right? So uh, he's there, and he's even like, hey, guys, we should be careful with this place. And everyone's like, shut up, Kaido. You don't know anything. Kaido was basically the Meg of this group at this point, like the, like, family guy. Yeah, he was the Meg. So he's like, oh, man, that sucks. Um, I guess at one point during God Valley, we haven't seen it yet exactly, but he was on Death's Door. Uh, maybe Roger Kamusari'd him in the chest or something like that, and he got dropped, and he was bleeding out, and he was about to die. Uh, and the only way to save him was uh, feeding him the de one of the devil fruits that was a prize at God Valley, which in this case was the Ua Ua no Mi model Azure Dragon, or the Seiryu, uh, the uh, blue dragon. And so Big Big Mom got her hands on that after uh, taking it away from Ivankov, and so she was about to use the ability. I mean, she couldn't use it herself because she already had the soul, soul fruit, but maybe Big Mom was planning on giving it to one of her children. That was probably the idea. And so uh, Kaido was about to die, though, and since Big Mom did view Kaido as kind of like a little brother figure to herself, she was like, okay, I'll, I'll make sure he doesn't die. Gives him the Ua Ua no Mi, turns into a dragon, however, also gives her, uh, gives him uh, like, hey, you, this is a life debt, you know what I mean? You have, you owe me at some point to be called upon whenever and Kaido's like okay I guess and so he's alive he survives um after the events of God Valley Rox dies this is a running theme I'm discovering in this in this uh video here um Kaido goes off uh he does not join Big Mom's crew or whatever uh maybe there was a falling out there maybe there was something of just like you know um you know I, just because you gave me this fruit doesn't mean I have to join your crew or, or something like that um, yeah, I guess, why didn't Big Mom just, like, hey, the life debt is, hey, I'll give you this fruit, but you gotta join my crew if you do. Because Kaido would have been a huge asset to Big Mom's crew if, she, if he was a member from, like, way back then. Interesting, actually, where that went. Uh, we'll probably find out more about that when we explore the entire flashback of God Valley at some point. Anyway, so uh, Kaido goes off and uh, gets captured more times, eventually ends up at Punk Hazard, uh, the place where, you know, Vegapunk is experimenting on everything and uh, is getting uh, blood drawn from him to be extracted for devil fruit experiments, and eventually uh, Momonosuke's uh, artificial zone, the dragon artificial zone, his pink dragon would be developed from Kaido's DNA, his lineage factor. Eventually, uh, one day, just because he feels like it, I guess, Kaido decides to break out and uh, frees a uh, Lunarian boy that was trapped there as well by the name of King, and and so uh, they leave Punk Hazard, they blow the whole place up, and it's like, hey, King, join my crew. Uh, or rather, he gives him the name King. His uh, original name is Albert, and he's like, oh, you should be named King from now on. You're really strong. You Join my crew. And uh, King, being a Lunarian, was also aware of the legend of Joy Boy, and so believed Kaido to be Joy Boy. And so the idea is like, all right, you're Joy Boy, you're going to herald in the new era and everything like that. And I guess Kaido ended up believing it over the years. I, I don't think he bought it at first, but over the years, he was like, maybe I am Joy Boy boy all right let's do this um begins to build up his own pirate crew queen a uh, former member of mads eventually joins uh jack joins a little later because he's only 28 years old like right now in the story so by the time uh he was uh, like attacking odin castle and odin was killed and everything like that uh jack would have only been eight so i'm not really sure how he joined the crew but um jack and queen and king become the uh three calamities that are the uh, officers of the beast pirates um, that's something else I also forgot to bring up during Big Mom's segment was the three sweet commanders. But once again, I, I have made all these sorts of videos about discussing their crews at length and everything like that. Higurashi, who was a former member of Rox's crew, uh, purportedly, uh, we didn't really see her in the flashback, but she was most likely a member there because she had copied the faces of everybody that was there. She had copied Shiki's face and Stussy's face and everything. So she is a member of the Kurozumi clan. She goes back to Wano after God Valley, finds out everything is so messed up there with the Kurozumis being persecuted, finds Orochi, who is the grandson of the Kurozumi daimyo that started all this with his betrayal. And so, basically, Higurashi comes up with an idea to recruit Kaido, or rather point Kaido in the direction of Wano. It's just like, ah, Kaido! Long time no see. He's like, what is it, old hag? 
Do you want power? I'm listening. There's an island deep in the New World with really powerful samurai. This was at the point where Odin had left with Whitebeard, and they were kind of like a, like a Sukiyaki was like still the Shogun, but they were still kind of like trying to get rid of him and install Orochi. So while this was going on, Higurashi met with Kaido. Um, and Higurashi was like, yeah, there's this place, Wano, we're about to um, get rid of the Shogun and uh, set up Orochi to be the new Shogun. And he'll basically, you know, he needs some power to back him, though, in order to make this work. In order to make the Kurozumis rule this land, we are going to need your help. But the people of Wano, I mean, you could turn that entire country into a weapons factory and a big fortress, and it could all be yours. And so Kaido was just like, hmm, I see. All right, I'll go check it out. And so about that time, around like somewhere between 30 to 25 years ago, Kaido goes to Wano, establishes himself there, meets Orochi. They work together. Uh, Wano begins to be modernized into the sense of like the giant factories and enslaving the population and throwing them in there to work to make weapons for his beast pirates, okay? Oh, it was also around this time that Kaido had uh, his only child that we are aware of, uh, Yamato. We don't know the situation with Yamato's mother, but about, you know, 28, I guess 29 years ago, that was when Yamato was conceived. We don't really even know if Kaido was married, probably wasn't, probably was a one-night stand type of thing. Um, but yeah, that, that might be revealed later on as well. So... Establishes, establishes himself as the dragon god of Wano, because at that point he could turn into a giant freaking dragon, and he could fire giant boro breaths of fireballs and everything like that. It's really scary. And so Orochi's there, like, I am Lord Orochi! And yeah, there was this uh, attempted revolt by Odin, but uh, Kaido takes care of that pretty quickly. Uh, actually, it wasn't looking good for a while, but then Higurashi showed up, transformed into Momonosuke, who's Odin's son, and that kind of, like, distracted him long enough for Kaido to get the killing blow. Uh, Higurashi dies shortly thereafter, so not a big deal there. Uh, Higurashi having the Mane Mane no Mi and Semi Maru, who I think is Higurashi's brother, having the power of the barrier. Barrier fruit also didn't help very much. Very annoying combination there. Uh, but eventually, yeah, Odin is killed. Uh, the remaining scabbards are either separated, they leave Wano, or they are sent off with, uh, Toki's time powers, and that is, once again, getting into the current story of one piece that we are all very much aware of right so he holds his position as a uh the i guess guardian deity not really a guardian deity more of just an oppressive deity of wano that happens to be a dragon and so they begin to build up everything kaido's ultimate plan here is building wano up to a pirate paradise essentially kind of making a new hachinosu as it were right and eventually spread out to take over the world and find the one piece that's the ultimate goal here takes about 20 years to build everything up. Uh, you got the three calamities that I mentioned, uh, the, the, the disasters, uh, King, Queen, and Jack. You also got the Toby Ropo, the Flying Six. You have Caesar Clown working and Doflamingo producing the the uh, smiles, which are really bad knockoff Vegapunk artificial devil fruits that turn you into these weird animal abominations, but whatever, they're close enough to zones and they can fight well, right? I guess it depends on the fruit, but um, anyway, yeah. So he's divided up. He got the waiters, which are like the front line fighting force, like the Vanguard. You got the pleasures, which are the failed smile users. You got the gifters that have the power of the smiles, that have weird animal bodies, parts sticking out of them. You got the headliners that are the officers, the Toby Ropo are higher than the headliners, then the disasters, and then you have Kaido himself, okay? There you go. But yeah, eventually, Luffy ends up fighting Kaido one-on-one. -on -one. It was a very tough fight. You had the scabbards, you had Zoro get some hits in, Kid and Law and Killer were all there. Um, that was really cool. What's your favorite moment during the battle with Kaido. What was the single attack that you liked the most? Was it Zoro's Dead Man's Game? Was it Killer's Sonic Cutter? Was it Luffy's, you know, Monkey God Gun? Or, you know, like the Baj you know, like the Gear Fifth, you know, Super Giant Fist? Like, which was it? Or well, maybe it could have been a technique that Kaido used as well, like his Molten Dragon form, you know, or his Man Beast form, you know? Um, what, what technique was displayed during the fight with Kaido that you liked the most? That's the question with that one, right? So, um, yeah, that was the situation with Kai Dio. That's, that's that there. And, um, yeah, uh, Luffy, uh, turns into Joy Boy and punches a giant hole through Wano and he gets knocked into a hole. And, uh, that, uh, oh, the hole was connected to a volcano. Sorry, that's kind of important. <laughs> that's kind of important. Falls into the same hole as Big Mom, ends up in the volcano. And as we've already mentioned, that's pretty much the, the go-to way to, to get rid of a Yonko. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's, there's that. Okay. So 
How long is this video already? Oh, that's that's looking long. Okay. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to break this up into another part just because we are already really long into this video and I've only talked about three of the emperors. Uh, we will get to the remaining four. Now, keep in mind, like I said, Luffy's is not going to be referenced that much. He just became an emperor, so his will be more of an epilogue, if anything. Um, really, in the next part, we will be discussing Blackbeard, who is older than Shanks, then Shanks, and then Buggy, who everybody is waiting for, right? So, wait back here until next time. We'll do part two of the four emperors. I really... and that, that is kind of confusing, but... Otherwise, this video is going to end up being like three hours long, and uh, I need a break. <laughs> so, we'll do this in two parts. Really appreciate it, everybody. Thanks for watching, uh, and uh, look forward to that one following. Uh, I, I will get that one out as soon as possible. That will not be a situation where, like, in June, I get out part two of this. No, that'll be the next video I work on after this. This was intended to be one thing, but my god, there was a lot to discuss here. It was funny because... I did the video on the seven warlords, which really ended up being like 11 warlords. And it was like, man, I got that video done in like 50 minutes. This, three of the emperors in, we're like over an hour and like 10 minutes into this. So it's like, what? All right. Anyway, see you back here for part two. This will be Teching signing out. Later, everyone.